May I have your attention, please? The court reporter can start. We are on the record at this time. May I have your attention, please? I declare this hearing open at 7.07 p.m. This is a public hearing for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, Bureau of Air and Waste, the Metropolitan Boston Northeast Regional Office, and will be conducted in accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Law 30A. Please note that this is the first hybrid public hearing that MassDEP has conducted. We thank you for your patience as well as we may have to work through a few technical challenges. We have interpreters here this evening who will be translating from English to Spanish and Portuguese and from each of those languages into English. Headsets are required to facilitate with translation. You need to leave a form of identification in order to use a headset. Your ID will be returned to you when you return your headset. All headsets are available at the back of the room. We are here today at 7.07 p.m. on December 7, 2022 in Peabody, Massachusetts at the Theresian Senior Center to accept comments from the public addressing the proposed decision of the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Companies, also known as MWICS, CO2 Budget Emission Control Plan. The Department of Environmental Protection's regulations at 310 CMR 7.70 require that any emission unit that serves as an electricity generator producing more than 25 megawatts shall be a CO2 budget unit and shall be subject to the requirements of 310 CMR 7.70. 310 CMR 7.70, um, pa parenthetical three, requires the submission of an emission control plan. The scope of this hearing is to accept testimony and comments on whether the proposed decision for the MWIC project meets the requirements of 310 CMR 7.70. My name is Edward J. Brasick. I am the Air Quality Permit Chief for the Department of Environmental Protection's Metropolitan Boston Northeast Regional Office, and I will be serving as the hearing officer for this hearing. Sitting with me is Eric Worrell, Regional Director of MassDEP's Northeast Regional Office, and Quan Tat, Environmental Engineer of my staff from the Bureau of Air and Waste. Notice of this hearing was published in the Environmental Monitor on November 23rd, 2022. Copies of the notice of this hearing, the proposed decision, the project back sheet, and the project public information plan were provided via electronic mailing to local municipalities and interested parties list established during the Department of Public Utilities hearing. These documents are available at the Department of Environmental Protection's Metropolitan Boston Northeast Regional Office at 205 B Lowell Street in Wilmington and appeared on the MassDEP website at www.mass.gov DEP. The CO2 Emission Control Plan application and MassDEP's proposed decision are available on the EEA ePlace public access portal at https colon slash slash eeaonline.eea.state.ma.us slash eea slash public app slash the CO2 emission control plan application, MassDEP's proposed decision and the administrative record are also available for inspection at MassDEP's office at the above letterhead address. Comments on the proposed decision must be submitted in writing 
by 5 p.m. December 14, 2022. Comments may be submitted via the public access portal, via electronic mail to edward.brasic at mass.gov, or via mail. Comments provided on the proposed decision should only address issues presented in the CO2 budget emission control plan application and whether MassDEP's proposed decision complies with the requirements of 310 CMR 7.70. The proposed decision contains two monitoring components. The first component addresses how MWIC will monitor the CO2 emissions in accordance with 40 CFR Part 75. The CO2 emissions are calculated in order to determine a more precise measurement of the natural gas and ultra-low sulfur distillate, otherwise known as ULSD, fuel combustion and creation of CO2 emissions. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, REGI, trading program regulations require this type of fuel-based monitoring because it is a more accurate procedure for monitoring emissions of various pollutants. The second component of the monitoring plan is the measurement of the electricity produced and released to the electric grid. The proposed decision does not address the construction or the operation of the MWIC facility. And I just want to ask, did everyone uh, present sign the attendance sheet and have individuals identified whether or not they wish to comment or not? Once again, translators are present to aid non-English speaking individuals. Please, please let us know if you need assistance. Before we begin taking comments, I just want to make clear the purpose of this hearing. MassDEP has provided this hearing to receive comments on the proposed decision, and individuals should only address issues presented in the CO2 budget emission control plan application, and whether MassDEP's proposed decision complies with all of the requirements of 310 CMR 7.70. Please note that only comments on the CO2 budget emission control plan application and proposed decision will be considered in MassDEP's review of the submitted public comments. Comments submitted addressing the September 30, 2020 non-major comprehensive plan application approval or the non-major comprehensive plan application are outside the scope of the CO2 emission control plan application and proposed decision. If we experience any technical problems during the hearing, such as background noise, video or audio issues, the stenographer may request a speaker to repeat themselves. I ask anyone who speaks tonight remotely to mute their audio when listening and only unmute when it is your turn to speak. This will ensure the best audio quality for everyone. Please speak slowly and clearly and allow the prior speaker to finish before you begin speaking. We greatly appreciate everyone's participation tonight. We have um, a, a number of people in the audience who wish to speak and we're not quite sure how many people are going to be wishing to speak on Zoom. So we would like to limit the, the time for people to speak to five minutes. This way we will, everyone will get the opportunity to speak and uh, we wish to hear everyone's opinion. I will now ask anyone who wishes to offer comments to come forward when called and identify themselves by name and affiliation prior to presenting their comments. Also, please submit any copies of your written comments to the panel before commenting. For those joining us remotely, please make sure your Zoom name reflects your full name. If interested in providing comments, please type your name and affiliation or town in the chat along with your email address. We will call on speakers in the order in which they have requested to speak. When called upon to speak, 
please state your name, affiliation, or town before beginning your comments. I will now open the hearing for comments. We will begin with state and elected officials. And our state and elected official, Sally Kearns, state representative. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the DEP for holding this hearing. I, I do applaud your efforts to make it a both virtual and in-person um, event and opportunity for people to be heard about the uh, emissions control plan for the proposed peak capacity um, project 2015A is the name that we've come to know this project by. Um, uh, so I thank you for the opportunity to be heard and for my neighbors here in Peabody and Danvers to be heard. Um, to my knowledge, in the seven years that this project 2015A was being planned, this is only the second public hearing uh, about the plant, and um, which is really quite remarkable. Um, no public hearing by either MWEC uh, or the DEP or, or any entity has been held in the town of Danvers. And that's really stunning because um, as many people in Danvers as anywhere will be affected by this plant. Uh, these are uh, the emissions from the existing plants along with other environmental stressors make Danvers people just as as Peabody people to what will be emitted. Uh, so I would also like to note that the only reason that people in Danvers knew came to out the plant is because of the work of Mass Climate Action Network, Mass Action, and um, now Slingshot. And I think we owe them uh, a thank you, because without, without that activism, we would not have known. And to date, no one has ever sent anything to the town of Danvers to say, we'd like to let you know about this peak capacity power plant that we're planning to construct almost in the middle of the Waters River. So um, this is a welcome opportunity. Um, I wasn't planning on having to hold a mic, so. No, I got it, I got it. Um, so unfortunately for every single person who will be breathing in the air that is going to be impacted, we don't know the extent of the impact, we're still hoping for an environmental impact, uh, health impact study, but um, unfortunately um, the DPU and state regulators have chosen not to apply the provisions of the much heralded climate roadmap law that we passed in the legislature. A remarkable piece of legislation, very carefully constructed over many, many years and uh, a huge achievement. And unfortunately, decided to not a to this project. I don't, I don't know why this is going in and out, but. Um, <clears throat> so the climate roadmap law will put the Commonwealth on the path to net zero emissions. Thank you. Roadmap bill. Great bill. Great law. Um, and it will put us on a path in Massachusetts to lower carbon emissions. And it's very, very unfortunate and very troubling to me and to many people that we've chosen, rather, the DPU has chosen not to apply the provisions. I am fervently hoping that the DEP, in its assessment of the emissions control plan, will decide to do so. 
Um, physicians and our public health professionals tell us we have elevated levels or rates of asthma right here, right here in this neighborhood, over here. Uh, the new peak capacity gas powered generator will sit smack in the middle of a neighborhood literally surrounded by Route 114, Route 128, Endicott Street, and the main route to Salem. And no doubt the vehicular traffic coupled with whatever comes from these three plants, because remember, there are already two there. So that's, I'm going to get to my request of DEP on that point in a second. Um, but the generator will sit practically in the Waters River uh, within a few hundred yards of a neighborhood that was literally blown up in 2006 by human error in a paint factory. Miraculously, nobody was killed. There are plans now for a school so close to where this plant will sit that you would have to ask, would it be safe for children at that school to play outside at recess? Uh, so for sure, the legacy of 20th century and 19th century industries in this area is all around us. You can see it from the Waters River when you look over to this plant. Uh, there's a gas pipeline running under the lovely marsh out behind uh, Mass General Brigham, um, where the Endicott pear tree is located. Um, power lines up above, liquefied natural gas plant along the way. How much does one neighborhood have to endure? That is the question that we've been asking. Just how much? So we are talking very much about an environmental justice area, and yet we're not going to apply the, the tools that we have. We're not going to say, hey, we've got this climate law, MWEC. You're going to need to make some adjustments. You're going to have to take that into account. Um, somehow the DPU said yes. The DPU, by the way, refused to let the good folks of Mass Climate Action Network participate as interveners in that proceeding, very disappointing. Um, so my request tonight to the DEP, um, you've issued an air permit for this, is that you will hold this project now to current standards. And I'm given hope because it appears that you did something very similar to that in the case of the Palmer biomass plant. Um, <laughs> So this was uh, last week, I know I'm, I'm going on long, but you can't, you have to factor in. A lot of my minutes got used up by the craziness of the beginning. So, um, so I'm quoting now um, from a news story. The Mass Office of Appeals and Dispute Resolution on Monday upheld an April 2021 DEP decision to revoke an air permit issued in 2012 for the Palmer Renewable Energy Facility. In Monday's ruling, Stephanie Cooper, Mass DEP's Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Planning, wrote, she was certain that the agency exercised its authority and discretion in revoking the air permit and added, quote, more recent societal context and heightened focus on environmental justice are relevant to this matter, citing requirements under a 2021 climate law and updated executive branch, updated executive branch environmental justice policies. Mass DEP has changed its processes for reviewing these types of permit applications to both ensure that both people living in EJ communities have a genuine opportunity to participate in decision making impacting their health and environment and that the environmental burdens on these communities are considered. Any future permit application seeking approval of the proposed facility must be evaluated with the benefit of enhanced public engagement. That is what I'm asking tonight. I think that's what we're all hoping. Apply the same air quality standards 
for this project and the ECP in this neighborhood as you would for a project in another EJ neighborhood. Uh, and in addition, I think that the department, the applicant, MWEC, and the department should provide the public with the timeline for taking the other plants offline. And I, I don't want to take more time than, than, I, than is fair, but I will just say this, that um, the whole issue of cumulative emissions is very important here. And I feel strongly, and I know we all do, that you cannot look at just the emissions control budget for this one plant. You have three. You'll have three when this one is done. What is the timeline for, re for removing other plants from operation? And how will you measure all of those emissions together? I think MWEC tried to make the argument, if I read it correctly, or understood it correctly, they were trying to make the argument that they and PMLP are different and you can't hold one accountable for the actions of the other. But I don't think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about cumulative emissions. So um, I would appreciate clarification on that. Um, I thank you very much for your careful consideration of the comments that you will hear from my neighbors uh, and me tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to call Susan Smoller. Good evening. Hey, it's working. We're good. Good evening. I'm Susan Smaller, and I'm a 37-year resident of Peabody, living at Three Loman Circle. And I am co-founder of the Breathe Clean North Shore Group, a grassroots effort fighting against Emwick's new peaker, as well as the two existing peaker plants at the same site on Pulaski Street. We are happy to welcome you to Peabody. This is a new experience for us since the siting process for this plant was not very transparent. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight in solidarity with your Peabody friends. We extend a particularly warm welcome to our neighbors across the river in Danvers the only environmental justice area in Danvers, and they breathe the same air we do in Peabody's eight environmental justice areas. We, the communities of the Waters River, share the health impacts of living with cumulative environmental pollution resulting from industrial development around the Waters River for more than a century. Danvers is not a member of EMWIC, and receives nothing but risk from this peaker plant on Pulaski Street. I want to extend another warm welcome to our neighbors from Salem and their city council, who recently issued a resolution against the new peaker plant, and our friends from Marblehead. Thank you. Sustainable Marblehead also issued statements and resolutions opposing the new peakers. So we appreciate that. I also want to give a shout out to the elected officials who are, joins us here tonight, Representative Sally Karens, City Councilor Tom Gould, the first time we've had city involvement in any way. Um, we appreciate it and I apologize if there's other officials here that I have not recognized. So, questions. Why does the air monitoring plan under consideration not apply to the entire Waters River Station? All three polluting peakers instead of only the new peaker. The new plant appears to rely heavily on sharing PMLP resources in addition to sharing the use of the city's land. The new plant is an add-on 
designated to share facilities and maintenance support with PMLP, including providing the new plant with natural gas via the Waters River site connection, allowing the new plant to connect with the regional high voltage transmission system by connecting to a PMLP substation and sharing a new, new ULSD 200,000 gallon oil storage tank with both facilities. Why does the monitoring plan focus solely on CO2? How are other byproducts of the plant monitored, such as NOx and PM 2.5? Don't the residents of the environmental justice areas surrounding the plants deserve a plan that monitors all the pollution being created by the plants, not just the one under construction? BCNS has requested several times that PMLP provide information on when the existing plants run and what they are burning to no avail. We continue to request that information in hopes of adding it to the data from purple air sensors that the Peabody Board of Health received with funding from the DEP and to help identify how running the plants on different fuels contributes to our high rate of emergency room visits for asthma. Please require EMWIC to provide a regular report to the public on when the new plant runs and what it is burning as well as the monitoring results. And I think that is in included in what we're here to discuss tonight. The monitoring plan, if you're listening, um, is that they should be providing reports of what their plan shows us and tells us. Please also require the, that EMWIC publish when the new plant is tested, since testing requires the plant to run continuously for a number of hours, up to eight hours. We have requested the same of PMLP regarding the two existing plants, again, to no avail. Without a complete picture of the air quality around the plant, how can we follow the 2021 Massachusetts Climate Roadmap lap, map and law and a 2021 update to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs Environmental Justice Policy that mandates increasing protections for low-income communities of color. Our three plants are within a minority EJ area and largely surrounded by EJ areas. The communities along the Waters River are disproportionately impacted by pollution, as highlighted by the Massachusetts Climate Action Network's preliminary health analysis of the areas within a 1.5 mile, mile radius of the plants. The prevalence of disease in these areas is significantly higher compared to the rest of the state. We have higher rates of stroke, chronic kidney disease, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and coronary heart disease. MCAN study highlights the need for additional analysis. It's been seven years since the new plant was proposed. Life has changed. 2022 is not the time to be investing in a new oil and gas infrastructure now that battery storage is a viable alternative and there are new renew renewable alternatives. The number of our environmental justice areas have increased since 2015. We can only hope that you will act as the state did recently when the Massachusetts Office of Appeals and Dispute, Dispute Resolution, Resolution excuse me, upheld the revocation of a permit for the proposed site of a wood energy plant in Springfield. I won't repeat what Sally said, but basically they said that decisions should reflect recent societal context and heightened focus on environmental justice. And I believe decisions about Peabody speakers should reflect those same issues, recent societal context and heightened focus on environmental justice. 
The burden that neighboring communities are already facing is clear. Do not further exacerbate these impacts. The Peabody Peaker project should not be permitted to move forward, especially if no community health assessment is conducted. Instead of adding to the burden of the community, we should be reducing it. The city of Peabody and the PMLP should look to retire not one, but both of the existing facilities that are currently polluting and harming affected neighborhoods. I do want to thank you for holding this hearing tonight and restoring my faith in the public meeting process. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would just like to uh, call Julie Smith Galvin if she wishes to speak. I didn't sign up, but I will make um, some brief comments. I don't have anything prepared. Thank you. My name is Julie Smith Galvin. I am a town councilor in the town of Wakefield. Wakefield is one of the 14 communities that has purchased um, capacity from this project. I first want to thank you for being here. I, I echo um, what has already been said. Um, having a public process is absolutely essential in this, and it has what has been missing over the past seven years. Um, the Wakefield Board of Health has requested a health impact, as many of the adjacent communities have. Um, and at the, the hearing a year and a half ago, we were in this room, and MWEC made a lot of promises about um, shutting down other plants, um, about using hydrogen when it's going to become available. And I think all of those things need to be taken into consideration. But we also really need to look at what this plant is now. As was just said, we need to look at the societal context and the technological advances and the environmental justice. And the DPU did not con consider this, despite the climate roadmap really directing them to do so. And so I implore you, on behalf of the 14 communities that are buying into this, uh, the environmental justice areas and all the people and all the adjacent communities, to really look at this, to look at the cumulative impacts and to think about what this plant means to health and the environment going forward. Thank you. Thank you. We'd also like to call Stephanie Peach, if she wishes to speak. Hi, thank you very much. I uh, was not planning to speak. I, I do feel so compelled after, after hearing the representative speak and hearing Sudi speak. Um, Sudi really is the resident of Peabody who brought this to my attention. I represent Ward 3, which is where this peaker will lie, um, where also the two existing peakers for PMLP exist. And um, I was here a year and a half ago at the first hearing that you had and very much appreciate that that started, um, albeit a little late. But um, for the residents of Peabody, difficult. Um, it's a tough pill to swallow. We, we sit in this great area where we have a municipal light plant. Um, we benefit from great electrical rates. Um, and we understand the position that MWEC is in and would enable to be able to provide those rates. Um, we need to produce more electricity. And I have learned more about the grid in the last year and a half than I ever thought I would in my life, but um, I've become an expert on electricity and the grid and construction in the past year as a city councilor of Ward 3, so I guess I have MWEC to thank for a lot of that. Um, I do have a couple notes I jotted down. Um, I, I do want to just again thank Sudi, thank the other activists who have really brought this to the attention of the elected officials as this, yeah, thank you. Um, this project was named in a way where I don't think the elected officials had really any idea what it was or what was actually going to happen or what they maybe agreed to, um, other than maybe the people on the, the Light Commission who understand this realm um, and this really niche industry that we're, that we're talking about here. Uh, but specifically, this neighborhood is an environmental justice neighborhood for reasons that date decades back. Uh, Peabody is from the leather industry, and we live in a polluted city. 
That is a fact, and there is no way around it. Um, we, we do take strides as, as a city, as residents, to improve that uh, whenever, whenever possible, and we work with our state and our federal government to do so. And it's really hard for us to then say, we're going to add something else that may pollute the very air that we breathe and the area of the city that um, is already been impacted so heavily by the leather industry because this is the oldest part of Peabody that we're talking about here. Um, and you're actually constructing a peaker plant across, this, you know, across the way from an old leather factory um, and some mill buildings that we've been able to revitalize and use in better ways and clean up a lot of that area. I understand this peaker um, from the conversations that have been had at previous meetings and from conversations I've had with other experts in the field is much cleaner than the peakers we currently run. So my big ask from the DEP is that there is a timeline to shut down the existing diesel peakers that we run in Peabody. And I know that's through um, PMLP, but... I, I think it's important for us to know what is that timeline. There should be a timeline. Um, Peabody is bearing the burden for 14 other communities that are buying into this. Danvers, who doesn't even buy into this, is bearing the burden um, environmentally. And I understand that this peaker that, that is being built is strides ahead of the existing peaker as far as environmental impact, but there is still an impact. So I also ask that the community health assessment is run. That's all we've asked for at this point run the community health assessment. Um, if, this, if this project was approved two years later, you would be required to run that health assessment. Um, we didn't know about this. And now that we do, we are involved. You have, you have a wants to be in there. I don't know what's happening. Keep talking? Okay. A community that wants to be involved, that wants to be heard, that wants to work with you in an effort to do right by the people that live around here, um, but also make sure that, you know, we understand electricity needs to be produced, we understand that people live here and are impacted by it, and where can we, where can we find some common ground and where can we meet in the middle? So I think a community health assessment is really step one. Um, our health department stepped up really big. They took a DEP um, grant that they were given and they have run assessments on their own and will continue to and I thank our health director for doing that. Um, and, and also just finally I will, I will ask that the official um, do continue to get communication as, as we move forward in this process and if the peaker is ultimately built. Um, as Sudi mentioned, get updated reports when the peaker is run. Really important that the people of Peabody and, and how to do this, but um, made aware of but and the continuous information is provided to us. We are able to provide that to the residents, um, and and if you are just communicating with the elected officials of these towns and cities that are impacted, we are able to that to our constituents and make sure that at least people know what's going on and that's really the bare minimum that we can ask for at this point um, but again to reiterate a health assessment should be done on this project um, and, and continuous involvement from the community uh, whether this is a built is really essential I'd like to call Mark D'Elia. Sorry. My name is Mark DeLay. I'm a resident of Peabody. I've lived here for about 30 years. I'm an urban planner, I've been involved in climate action type of, of planning for, for some time. Uh, my wife and I, for 11 years, 
uh, have had Peabody's first uh, all solar house. Uh, <laughs> and when I uh, I went I went to the June meeting that MWEC held, and I recall them saying how, gee, we'd like to do batteries, but batteries are just too expensive, so we're going to have to do a conventionally fossil-fueled peaker plant. Uh, I also write articles for City Magazines on climate, so I've got a lot of notes kicking around. I'm also doing a website on how cities can approach climate action. So I've got all sorts of information here on my desk. So I decided when I heard about this meeting that I would take a look at peaker plants and what they're doing, who's using them, uh, what's their future, what's their present. And I found a lot of, mostly what I'm finding is how energy storage is pretty much making peaker plants, fossil fuel peaker plants, obsolete. Now, I've sent by an email attachment to yourself, the moderator, uh, a copy of what I put together here. It's about five pages, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to stand here and read them all, but I'd like to just put in a few highlights, one of which is that, and not too many people know it unless they've dug into the contents of the Inflation Reduction Act. It was 2015 when MWIC did its study and came out with what they're still saying is the only way to go. Things have changed hugely since then. The Inflation Reduction Act has massive billions and billions, as Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions of dollars uh, for all kinds of green energy projects, including energy storage, which is what we're really needing here as opposed to a peaker plant. And it also makes the investment tax credits that were formerly only available to tax-paying organizations, private companies, they are now available through what's called direct pay to cities, towns, municipal light plants, energy cooperatives, that sort of thing. So any argument that MWEC had made regarding we just can't afford batteries, that's totally out the window. That's, that's just doesn't, doesn't calculate anymore. Uh, a study recently done this year by the National Renewable <clears throat> Energy Lab, part of the Department of Energy, it says significant deployment of energy storage can successfully balance load and meet demand at all hours while helping electricity grids run more efficiently. There's another one uh, from the um, batteries and hybrid renewable plus storage projects will be a massive grid resource. The Sandia National Laboratories, I think everybody's heard of them, energy storage to replace peaker plants. And there's a whole lot of these. Uh, some of the options are, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, is hot sand storage. It originated in Finland about five years ago for district heating. But now it's being used for district heating and electrical generation. And it's ultra low key, it's super cheap, all you need is hot sand that you heat up with either uh, leftover cheap off-peak off electricity or you heat it up with wind or, or solar, preferably. Uh, so there's a lot on hot sand and where it's being used around the country. There's a concept called virtual power plants, VPPs. This is where you sort batteries into the businesses and the homes of people who live in the, in the grid, and they have an agreement with the utility that when power is running low, some of the energy from their batteries that they've been given or bought at a nice price go back into the grid. This is a peaker plant without a peaker plant. Another one is community microgrids. Uh, some of you may know what microgrids are. It's, it's forming, it's, it's sort of like living off grid within the grid. You can either be connected to the grid or not. It can involve renewable energy or it can be just used with batteries. And you can mix in some of these. You can mix in different types of storage. You can mix in vir virtual power plants with community microgrids. Uh, that's all I really want to say. I just wanted to cover the high points of that, but I, I do want to reemphasize that the Inflation Reduction Act really changes the numbers of all of this. For, for anybody who didn't get a copy, I was passing out copies of this to people. If anybody wants one, I've got about 50 more. I'd like to call 
Muriel Bejani. Hello. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment tonight. Uh, my name is Mireille Bajani, and I am the co-executive director of Slingshot, a regional nonprofit that works alongside communities most impacted by environmental threats to take aim at polluters and build community power. I have been uh, supporting Breathe Clean North Shore in their campaign against this peaker plant for almost two years. In the last few years, Massachusetts has passed two significant pieces of legislation that have overhauled our state's considerations for and protections of environmental justice communities. It is a fact that had Project 2015A, or as we call it, the Peabody Peaker, been proposed this year or even last year, it would have, gone, it would have gone through a drastically different regulatory process, one that would have been more thorough, more transparent, and more cognizant of cumulative impact. It still baffles me that the state is allowing Emwick to proceed with a project that our laws now acknowledge is harmful to our most vulnerable communities, particularly when we have better alternatives. But that's not why we're here tonight, I know. Within the context of emissions monitoring, I want to return to the point of cumulative impact. This facility is being built on the same site as two existing peaking power plants. Two plants that have been polluting surrounding neighborhoods for decades with serious impacts. Preliminary studies have shown that cis tracts around the Waters River site have significantly higher levels pulmonary disease, cardiac issues, cancer, and other illnesses in other parts of the city and the state. This new facility cannot be considered in a vacuum. It will, it will be piling on top of existing emissions and generations of environmental racism and harm. For these reasons, I ask you to require increased monitoring of the two existing, existing facilities in addition to the carbon dioxide emissions monitored at 2015A. Residents of Peabody and Danvers deserve to know what is being spewed into their air. As residents of Springfield have been saying for years, we breathe what you burn. Speaking of Springfield, <laughs> speaking of Springfield, as other folks have brought up tonight, I want to commend the department on the revocation of the air permit for the Palmer biomass plant last year. That decision and the more recent upholding of the decision clearly note, as Sudi quoted this as well, the more recent societal context and heightened focus on environmental justice are relevant to this matter, referring to the 2021 climate law and updated policies. Um, Stephanie Cooper from the DEP said that the Mass DEP has taken steps, quote, to ensure both that people living in environmental justice communities have a genuine opportunity to participate in decision making impacting their health and environment, and that the environmental burdens on these communities are considered. Tonight's hearing is a significant step toward the former adjustment, creating space for public input, and for that we are tremendously grateful. Now we ask that you stand by the latter statement and exercise the full extent of your power to protect Peabody, Danvers, and residents across the Commonwealth. Staying within the confines of precedent and checkboxes required by law is not enough. We are in unprecedented times and we need you to be leaders. Please carry out... So I have three asks for you tonight. One, carry out a full community health impact assessment for this project. <laughs> two, ensure that the two existing peaker plants are closed to minimize, minimize cumulative impact. <laughs> and three, require increased monitoring of all facilities at the Waters River site. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd ne next like to call Logan Malik. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. 
Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Logan Malik, and I am the Interim Executive Director at the Massachusetts Climate Action Network. MCAN is a nonprofit grassroots organization with over 65 chapters across the Commonwealth, including in Peabody, and we work to, collect, uh, to cultivate and advance climate action on the local, statewide, and regional level so that people and communities in Massachusetts can thrive in a healthy, clean, and First, I want to thank the Department of Environmental Protection uh, for agreeing to hold this hearing. Uh, over the past seven years, residents of Peabody, neighboring communities, and the 13 other participating com uh, communities in Special Project 15A when it comes to this project and have largely not had an opportunity to understand and to voice their concerns about the impact that it will have on, on their communities. While this hearing can in no way make up for what has already been done by MWIC, PMLP, and the state agencies, uh, we see this as a very necessary and beneficial right direction and one that we are very, very grateful for. So thank you for being here. As the DEP continues to deliberate on whether or not MWIC CO2 budget emissions control plan considered or, or should be approved, M MCAN encourages you to, to, uh, to include the following considerations and to take them into account. Are the ambient emission levels dis discussed and outlined up to date? And are, do they accurately reflect the emissions in the surrounding area? I think we have some serious concerns that they are not up to date and that they do not accurately reflect what is taking place in the surrounding community. Second, and this is what has already been raised, but I will raise it again, the two existing facilities must be considered. They cannot be, they can, they collectively add up to over the capacity of this new project and collectively they will significantly increase greenhouse gas emissions and other harmful chemicals um, that, that residents will have to breathe and, and will have to go about their daily lives, going to school, going to the hospital, living in long-term care facilities with, and they will have to also suffer the repercussions of those emissions. Beyond the CO2 emissions control plan, we also call on DEP and the, uh, the Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to take the necessary steps to inform the community. And these have been, these have been iterated, I will iterate, I will repeat them again. But we must increase the monitoring of the two existing facilities that are currently polluting the neighborhoods. We must also conduct a community health impact assessment to evaluate the health risks. Our MCAN's assessment, which came out uh, last, last month, highlights just how, how serious the baseline, uh, the baseline health implications are for these residents. This is a matter of life and death for small children, for elderly and aging residents, it must be taken seriously and it must be accounted for in the analysis. <laughs> Finally, we still maintain that DEP and EEA, uh, that, D, that EEA should reopen the MEPA process and require an environmental impact report to be conducted. It's high time that we, that we meet and acknowledge the, the critical benefit that the Next Generation Climate Roadmap Bill will have on our communities. We further call on the PMLP and MWIC to recognize the injustice of building this peaker, to stop building this project, and to instead go forward with a clean alternative that would reduce emissions, combat our climate crisis, and provide other significant benefits to, our, to the surrounding community.
they must further reconcile the harm that they are causing if they move forward uh, to a community that our research shows have significantly higher prevalence for cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, coronary heart disease, and stroke. Those are not things to take lightly. And by, it, by installing this peaker, they will be further exacerbating the harms of, their commu of that community. We appreciate PMLP's first steps to agreeing to close the smaller of the two peakers, as well as their initial steps to build a battery facility uh, in the neighboring communities. They have taken steps to listen to the concerns of residents, and we are deeply appreciated, appreciative. However, we know that much more is needed uh, to right the wrong that even proposing this project has on the community, and we know that the best thing to do would be to stop the construction and use clean alternative solutions. In lieu of this, In lieu of this, we see the retirement of both of the existing facilities as a critical requirement of any reconciliation with the communities that have already been and will continue to suffer and be further harmed by this facility. So thank you so much for hearing our comments. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, I, will, I will go ahead and pass it on. I'd like to call Sharon Cameron. Good evening. My name is Sharon Cameron, and I'm the Director of Public Health for the City of Peabody. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment today on behalf of the Peabody Board of Health. I understand that the intent of today's hearing is to comment on the CO2 Budget Emissions Control Plan and that this hearing is part of DEP's public involvement plan as part of its initiative to enhance transparency in environmental permitting. It is unclear to whether an involvement plan was implemented prior to issuing the air quality plan approval for this project in September of 2020. At this fall's Mass Massachusetts Health Officers Conference, I had the opportunity to hear Commissioner Suberg discuss the initiatives of Mass DEP to promote environmental justice and specifically to address the cumulative impact of environmental stressors on environmental justice populations. There are many well-documented health concerns associated with fossil burning power plants. Emissions to sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other hazardous pollutants can contribute to cancer risk, birth defects, and harm to the nervous system and brain. Emissions of particulates increase the risk of heart disease, lung cancer, COPD, and asthma. Emission contributions from power plants increase levels of ozone and drive climate change, which can make breathing more difficult, increase allergens and the risk of fungal diseases, and affect health through the disruption of critical infrastructure, such as electrical, water, and sewer systems. Although Mass DEP has concluded that pollution emitted by the proposed plant will not exceed ambient air quality standards, the plant has the potential to produce an additional 12 tons per year of small particulates, 8.3 tons of carbon monoxide, 1.8 tons of ozone, 6.3 tons of nitrogen oxide, 51,000 tons per year of carbon dioxide equivalents, among others. A health assessment of the neighborhoods within two kilometers of this project, conducted by doctoral student Catherine Rogers of the BU School of Public Health, concluded, on average, census tracts in the focus area have significantly higher prevalence of cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, coronary heart disease, and stroke after you've adjusted for the prevalence of smoking, lack of health insurance, environmental justice status, and the total population. The state law signed in March of 2021, an act creating a next generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy, 
requires an environmental impact report for all projects that impact air quality within one mile of an environmental justice neighborhood. The city of Peabody has 41.5% of its population living in an environmental justice block. There are several EJ neighborhoods within one mile of the affecting four communities. Health has submitted two written requests to the DEP and to the governor's office requesting an environmental impact report and a comprehensive health impact assessment be conducted to evaluate this project's risks and benefits and to understand the potential impact of this project on the environmental justice neighborhoods across four communities who live in proximity. There has been no response to these requests. The Peabody Board of Health would like to once again request that MWEC be required to conduct a full environmental impact report and a comprehensive health impact assessment. We believe that these reports are absolutely necessary in order for decision makers and our residents to understand the likely impact of this project on the environment and on our vulnerable and disproportionately impacted residents. If the If the project does proceed, the assessment will also be necessary to understand the type of monitoring and mitigation strategies that will best protect our residents, as well as what mechanisms will be implemented to report data back to the community in a meaningful way, and what processes will be put into place to ensure that health and environmental concerns of residents will be addressed throughout the life of the project. The environmental justice policy of the state's Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs calls for meaningful involvement of affected persons and communities, as well as the equitable distribution of energy and, and environmental benefits and burdens. We understand the benefits of the proposed plan in terms of ensuring adequate energy capacity in the region with stable and known costs. However, we believe that it is impossible to understand the potential burdens of this project, particularly on vulnerable and disproportionately impacted residents, without a full environmental impact report and comprehensive health impact assessment. Thank you for your concern for the health, safety, and well-being of our community. I'd like to call Kate Enderlin. First, I'd like to thank you for giving us some time to give you our ideas on what the problems are with the speaker plant. I'm a member of 350 Mass, and I wanted to tell you that as a child, I had a very serious asthma problem. And in the 1950s, there were no inhalers, so I know how scary it is when you can't breathe. I live approximately one mile from the peaker plant, and as the crow flies, that is, or as the particulate matter is in the air that we breathe. I'm from Salem, but uh, very close to this thing. The health, this health issue is what made me very, uh, work very hard towards clean energy. I'm asking that you please require a community health assessment I don't know how you can make an honest decision regarding a Peabody Peaker plant without a health assessment to consider how the Peaker will affect the people who live in this area. They should not be considered collateral damage. Thank you. Um, it's just difficult to read the, one of the names here. Is it Amanda Nash? Hi, sorry about my handwriting. Uh, Amanda Nash, I act actually live in Northampton. I used to live in Gloucester, so this is my area. But um, I, I honestly don't really understand why we're here having this conversation. If the um, state and the DEP are genuinely concerned about CO2 emissions, there are other alternatives. Um, they are readily available. Other states are using them. Other countries are using them. I, I follow on Google the peaker plant news and 
uh, places are, are replacing their peaker plants with, with renewables and battery storage. So I don't see why we can't do that here too. Um, I think Massachusetts likes to think of itself as a leader, but um, I, I don't know what we're waiting for here. Um, at some point we have to bite the bullet and stop giving in to the, fo the fossil fuel industry and doing their bidding and start to address climate change. And, um, <laughs> I feel like the state is waiting for some kind of an invitation. So if that's what you're waiting for, here it is. I'd like to call Jim Malloy. Hello. Uh, my name is Jim Bloy, I'm from Salem. I'm co-chair of uh, Salem Alliance for the Environment, and I'm also a member of 350 Mass, the North Shore Group. And we support everything that has been said so far. Uh, we want these assessments done. They need to be done. If this plant had come through two years later, we would be looking at a very different scenario. It's not right, really, what is happening. We're in the middle of a crisis. This must be addressed. It's not that much we're asking for. These people are living in a polluted area that you want to add more pollution to. It's your responsibility. You're the DEP. You're approving this plant. This makes no sense in this day and age. This makes no sense for Massachusetts. This makes no sense for Peabody. Peabody is going to be left with a huge, huge boondoggle. There is no way in 10 years this plant is going to be running. The crisis will deepen. This is not in favor of Peabody residents. It's not in favor of any residents. We have got to stop this plant, and we will do our part to stop this plant. This is not the end. We will continue, and the plant, even if it keeps running, will be shut down by us eventually. Thank you. Thank you. So did Dr. Leona come? Come. Can you hear me now? I'm a sister of North I saw you last year for the Pika Planet. I sat here last year during the Pika Plant meeting, and you presented two and a half hours of information. We did not have the time to listen to anybody else. I am grateful to be here tonight at the second meeting and the many voices who have spoken about the health concerns, about emissions, about the use of fossil fuel again. The state has worked and passed laws that we have to follow, and we are encouraging you to look back at your papers and to follow the laws so that the residents of Peabody, Salem, and the surrounding communities, and especially Danvis, who didn't know about the meeting last year and are impacted by the effects of what's going to happen with the Pika plant. And as the gentleman just said, in 10 years, we're not going to have it. We don't have it now. So we are asking you to take a, an about face and go back to the plans. Thank you. Thank you. Do, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak? Hello. 
Could you please? My uh, name is Mary Klug. I live in Marblehead, and I wasn't planning on speaking. And I hope this isn't a rude question, but I'd like for all of you, the three of you up there, to think about where you live. Would you move to Peabody with your children and your grandchildren? Take a look at this audience. They have children. We older people, we are not going to be here in 10, 15 years. But our children are, and our grandchildren are. And if we don't damn well start doing something, they're all going to be sick. And yes, I'm angry. Thank you. Hi, my name is Judith Black. I live in Marblehead, a town that's bought into the Peaker. A few days ago, ISO New England had a meeting, and the FERC chair under um, our last leadership was the keynote. And every time someone asked him a question about energy investment and human rights, energy investment and the future of the safety of our planet, he just kept saying, that's not in my purview. That's not in my purview. And when I read about the meeting tonight, CO2 emissions from the new plant, how can that be the only thing in your purview? Thank you. Hi there, uh, Carolyn Bird from Ipswich. And I... Um, I'm sorry? Closer? Okay. Uh, I am not familiar with 310 CMR and all the different references under that. Um, but I would point out, so I don't know what the extenuating circumstances is. Is it just CO2 or are there some other things buried there? But I did want to bring to your attention uh, something that the city of Boston does with every building over 20,000 square feet. It appears to me in reading on their website of the requirements for what they call the BIRDO program, which is the uh, Building Emission Reduction and Disclosure Ordinance, that those buildings, every building in the city of Boston, more than 20,000 square feet, has more reporting requirements than this peaking power plant. And I would, I would encourage you to read what's required of those, of those buildings in Boston and compare them with this and then think of is this really adequate compared to a 20,000 square foot office building? Thank you. Thank you. We have anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak? Could you please state your name and address or affiliation? Yeah, Nathan Phillips. I'm from Newton, and I'm a ratepayer advocate with the Consumer Liaison Group of the ISO New England. And I, I wanted to, I don't know if it's on the public record, but I would like to put it on the public record that I'm aware that fundamentally the process that led to the permitting of this project was deceptive. And what I'm... What I'm referring to is the fact that last year in the only public meeting for this project, the CEO of MWEC stated to the public that battery storage was not a viable option for peaking plant. However, two weeks prior to that pu only public meeting for the community, uh, MWEC, in partnership with Anbaric Corporation, had bid for a 100 megawatt lithium ion storage project called the Westover Energy Center. So that was not mentioned in what was told to the public. So there was some duplicity going on uh, in basically trying to play both sides. So even the uh, MWEC was aware and is aware that battery storage is the way to go. And I just wanted to make 
clear and on the public record that uh, this whole process has been uh, a deceptive one to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak? If not, we're going to check to see if there are any commenters on Zoom. Five. Can you please put the first one forward? <laughs> Increase. 
countries promptly shifting away from fossil fuels and would offer immediate health benefits. In Peabody and the North Shore, we've started the clean air revolution. What do we want? Clean air. What do we want? Clean air. And we want it now. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you. Can we have the next uh, Zoom commenter, please? and love. I'm the co-chair of Salem Alliance for the Environment, along with Jim Malloy, the other co-chair, who you heard speak a few moments ago. Um, in 2014, when, oh, and by the way, I live in Salem, near another gas speaker plant at 17 Sutton Ave, Salem Woods. In 2014, when Governor Deval Patrick signed an executive order on environmental justice, Salem Alliance for the Environment was there at that meeting at the Chelsea Collaborative, a very, very stressed city that has, that, that the whole city is an environmental justice city. We celebrated that victory of Walt Patrick signing the executive order, but that executive order had no legal teeth, and we knew that. Safe then and there pledged to get involved in getting legislation passed. And in 2021, 2021, the Climate Roadmap Law finally became law. And it included environmental justice. But I ask myself now, what good is that victory of winning climate, environmental justice, getting it in on the legal and on the books? What good is that doing us? Here we are in the midst of watching the state finalizing another fossil fuel plant in an environmental justice neighborhood. A neighborhood bordered by other environmental justice neighborhoods in Salem and Danvers. This process is saddening and it certainly outrages us. Let's not make a mockery of our new environmental justice law by letting the plant this third people plant in Peabody go online. The only emissions control plan that is suitable for this third people plant is to not turn it on. Please have the next Zoom commenter, please. Because according to 
Rothschild hearing officer at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, it's critical to consider cumulative health impacts when approving new infrastructure projects. And the recent roadmap bill passed in the last Massachusetts legislative session now requires consideration of cumulative health impacts for all new construction, in part thanks to her advocacy. That would be your own colleagues' advocacy at the DEP. So historically, thanks to the approval of exactly this sort of project, Massachusetts has failed to do this. In fact, Massachusetts, as you know, ranks number one in the country for the inequitable location of hazardous polluting for the facilities. We have the highest number of people living in poverty near facilities like this. We have the highest percentage of elderly and communities of color living near these facilities, which is shocking because communities of color only make up 9% of communities in the state, yet they receive over 40% of the carcinogens. Why is that? Because our state consistently fails to take into account cumulative effects of pollution on populations living close to polluting facilities. Peaker plants, like the one that you are proposing here and we're considering carbon dioxide emissions for, run much dirtier than base load power plants because they only operate at peak powers, so peak, peak hours. So they start up and they stop a lot. That's a health problem because peaker power plants emit three to seven times more pollutants, like the oxides of nitrogen, during startup than during one hour of full load operation. Nitrogen oxide is a particular matter. Ozone, these pollutants are also known to engender, these facilities are also known to engender, are associated, as you know, with serious health outcomes, like asthma, heart attack, stroke, and cancer. Locating a polluting facility in the midst of an environmental justice community is, in effect, sentencing that community to such high levels of pollution that many who live there, children with asthma, elderly with COPD, will not be able to properly believe. Climate change is another excellent uh, argument. <clears throat> and looking at the CO2 emissions question again, the effect of the proposed peaker plant on climate change cannot be understated. At a time when we should be doing our utmost to stop the exponential increase in methane and CO2 in our atmosphere that's leading to health crisis after health crisis, from heat waves and forest fires, flooding and drought, your project will add significantly to that burden. In sum, this expansion of natural gas infrastructure is being carried out in the midst of an environmental justice community already living in the shadow of excess air, water, and soil pollution that are having measurable negative health impacts. I just saw a 71-year-old patient dying of end-stage COPD, and she lives, lived not far from the proposed peaker in While it's admittedly difficult to connect the dots with certainty in any individual case, that's the sort of health outcome we can expect to see more of should your project like this proposed peaker plan move forward. I would highlight the numerous health risks that I pointed here to tonight are only part of a comprehensive health impact assessment. An independent health impact assessment should properly consider the cumulative health effects of the respiratory carcinogens and include a quantitative analysis of the combined pollutant burner burden on cancer risk, non-cancer risk, and all-cause mortality using EPA risk estimates. In sum, to protect the health and safety of this environmental justice community and to start the important work of addressing climate change in the Commonwealth, which this project will very clearly worsen, I look to the DEP to exercise its leadership by the night. We have the next Zoom commenter, please. Hello, can you hear me? 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Stan Franzine. I live at 2203 Schoolhouse Road in Gloucester, having uh, recently relocated from Salem. Um, I'm on the advisory board of Salem Alliance for the Environment. Um, and my question is, given that a new administration will be taking office next month, is it prudent for DEP to make a decision of this magnitude during the last few weeks of the outgoing administration? Um, is it not more prudent to postpone any decision enabling the Peter Plant project to proceed without waiting for the new administration to weigh in on next steps for the project? But if you plan to make a decision on the project before the new administration takes office, I hope you will remember the unanimous feedback you will receive tonight opposing the plan. Thank you for this opportunity. Can we have the next speaker, please? the next commenter please. Is there any 
anyone else who wishes to provide any comments? So if there is no one else who's indicated previously the desire to present comments, uh, we are going to move forward. I would like to thank you all who participated in person and remotely. The comments brought forth at this hearing will be considered by the department before taking further action on the proposed CO2 budget emission control plan. The public comment period for this proposed project closes at 5 p.m. on December 14, 2022. At that time, the department will summarize and respond to the testimony and comments raised during the public review process. Copies of the response to comment document will be sent to all parties who have participated in the public review process and will be available on the department's website at www.mass.gov DEP. Considering that there are no further comments, I hereby close this hearing at 8.46 p.m. on December 7, 2022.